all God's people say it. Amen. 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 Boy, that was wonderful. We sang that song last night, and I said, man, if you can't preach after a song like that, you better find a new job. <laughs> hey, grab a Bible and go with me to the Gospel of Matthew in the fifth chapter. And while you're doing that, I want to welcome everyone joining us online, wherever you might be. So glad to have you worshiping with us through technology. What a great, great privilege it is to do that. Listen, I, I mentioned this uh, last week, I think, but I'm going to mention it again. Next weekend is Time Change Sunday. Sunday. You realize that, right? Everybody say, right. So we're going to spring ahead. I love daylight saving time. I know that everybody does, but I personally, I love it. I love it. But it is oftentimes devastating to our weekend attendance, which is really kind of pathetic if you stop and think about it. One hour, okay? But I, I'm, I'm just, so I want to encourage you to make sure that you, you make it to church. And if you can't make it at 10 o'clock like you normally do, then we have an 1130 service and I'll be looking for you then. I'm so worried about our 845 folks. I told them this morning that I've made arrangements, and you might want to think about 845 next week, but I made arrangements for us to have folks just outside the doors handing out free donuts, coffee, water, and juice <laughs> to people who come at 845 just as an extra incentive to get here on time. But let's make sure that that doesn't affect our ability to show up to worship the Lord. We're working our way verse by verse through the Gospel of Matthew in a sermon series called Let's Talk About Jesus. We're in Matthew chapter 5, which is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and a great, great passage of Scripture called the Beatitudes. So, uh, it's so important what we have to see in the Beatitudes. Let's not waste any more time. If you've got your Bibles open there, stand together with me in reverence and respect for God's Word like we always do as we make the public reading of Scripture a part of our service every week. We're going to be looking today specifically at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7, but as we've been doing, as we've gone through the Beatitudes, let's look at the whole passage. You follow along as I read, beginning in verse 1. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who went before you. All right, there it is. You can be seated. As always, we ask God's blessing on the reading and the hearing of His Word. I told you when we began to work our way through the Beatitudes that there are two fundamental truths that are absolutely essential to understanding what Jesus is teaching us in the Beatitudes, and we're going over them every week just as a reminder. The first one is this, God promises happiness that's real. God promises happiness that's real, and that's what we see in the Beatitudes. Nine different times in the Beatitudes, Jesus uses the word blessed. Blessed are the, blessed are those, blessed are you. I told you in the original language of the New Testament, that's the Greek word makarios. And while it's translated as blessed in our English Bibles, the closest English equivalent is the word happy. And so what we're talking about is a happiness here that God promises. Jesus is describing a happiness here in the Beatitudes, the attitudes that lead to happiness. But it's not happiness in the sense of a feeling that can be here one moment and gone the next. We all know what that's like. It's something so much more than that. It's a deep down level of inner contentment that is unaffected by the circumstances of life. And I want you to think about something with me. Isn't that what we all long for? A deep down level of contentment that is unaffected by the circumstances of life. No matter what happens to us, we still have that anchor deep down inside of us. That's what we all long for. We might not realize it because we might be searching in the wrong place areas to try to fill up that need, but that's exactly what all of us long for. And so God promises that kind of happiness here in the Beatitudes. The second fundamental truth is this. This real happiness comes in unexpected ways. It's all about attitude. Let me just take a minute to tell you why it's so important for us to understand this truth. It's important because what Jesus is giving us in the Beatitudes, beyond this explanation of how we can discover a happiness that's real, is an explanation of what it means to be a part of His kingdom. Let me say it like this. Jesus is giving us an explanation about how to be saved. The Beatitudes describe the attitudes that lead to salvation. 
Jesus came into a world where religious people put all of their emphasis on what they did on the outside. All of their emphasis was on their external actions. And so the the religion that Jesus encountered was shallow and superficial and hypocritical. Since it was all about actions, for many of the people, it was just going through the motions. And so their hearts were not involved. It was just going through the motions, just following the rules and the rituals, and it became hypocritical as a result. And so what Jesus does... And this is especially true, friends, in the Sermon on the Mount. What Jesus does is he begins to dismantle, attack and dismantle that hypocrisy, which is exactly what John the Baptist said that Jesus would do when he foretold his coming. In fact, I'm going to put a verse on the screen, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 10. Look at it. This is John the Baptist speaking. He says, the axe, listen to the, or or, or get the, the, the symbolism here, the axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, John the Baptist said that as he was anticipating the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, and he was saying that when Jesus comes, he's going to lay the axe of judgment to the tree of fake hypocritical religion. He was going to cut down that tree that is so utterly displeasing to God, false, fake, hypocritical religion is displeasing to God because God is more interested in what's going on in the inside of our lives than what's happening on the outside. He's more interested in our attitudes than our actions. Now, having said that, listen close. That doesn't mean that our actions don't matter. They do. But our actions must flow from the right attitudes. Our actions must be based in the right motivation. And that's not what Jesus found in the religious world that he came into. And so in his preaching and teaching, he went right for the heart. And we see that especially in the Beatitudes as he describes the attitudes that lead to salvation. He begins by talking about what it means to be poor in spirit and then what it means to mourn. He's talking about mourning over sin and then he talks about what it means to be meek and then he talks about what it means to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And today, we'll see that he talks about what it means to be merciful. So let's ask this question. Write this down in your notes. Let's ask this question. What does it mean to be merciful? What does it mean to be merciful? Now, I'm going to answer that question, but before I do, I want to pause for a moment, and I want you to pay real close attention to me, okay, because I don't have a lot of time to spend on this, but this is really important. I want you to see that when we get to Matthew 5, 7, where Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, we see a a new dimension. We see a shift or a new dimension in the Beatitudes, And here's how I'll describe it to you. There are eight Beatitudes, all of which describe the character of someone who is a genuine follower of Christ. But there's an interesting distinction between the first four Beatitudes and the last four Beatitudes. And here's how I'll describe it. We'll put it up on the screen so you can see it. The first four Beatitudes describe inner attitudes, while the last four describe the visible expression of those attitudes. Now, just leave that up for a second. I'm going to say it again, okay? The first four, there are eight Beatitudes. The first four describe inner attitudes, while the last four describe the visible expression of those attitudes. Let me make that even more clear to you. I'm going to put all the Beatitudes up on the screen. I'm going to put the attitude, and I'm going to put the corresponding expression of the attitude, and then I'll talk to you about them. First of all, the first Beatitude is, blessed are the poor in spirit. And what I want you to see is that that corresponds with the fifth beatitude that we're looking at today, which is blessed are the merciful. Now, why? Because when you are poor in spirit, which means when you recognize your spiritual poverty and your spiritual bankruptcy before God and the great need you have as a result of that to receive mercy from God, when God gives you that mercy, that means you're going to be willing to be merciful to someone else in light of their great need. The second beatitude is blessed are those who mourn. That corresponds with the sixth beatitude, which is blessed are the pure in heart. Why? Because when you mourn over the recognition of your sin, the corresponding result is you'll desire a pure heart. The third beatitude is blessed are the meek. That corresponds with the seventh beatitude, which is blessed are the peacemakers. Why? Because when you're meek, when you're gentle, when you're humble, the desire of your heart is to be a peacemaker. The fourth beatitude, which is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, corresponds with the eighth beatitude, which is blessed are those who are persecuted. Why? Because when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you'll be willing to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, do you see the connection? Everybody say yes, whether you do or not, because i got to move on. Yes. It's really fascinating. 
And it opens up a whole new dimension to the Beatitudes. What we have in the Beatitudes are four internal attitudes followed by four expressions of those attitudes. And the first expression is what we see here in verse 7 where Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. So let's get back to the question, what does it mean to be merciful? We don't get any real dramatic insight from looking at the meaning of the word in the original language. The word merciful is the Greek word laemon. And it's a very common word, it just means to have mercy on with a very broad application. No real insight there. You actually get a better feel for what Jesus is talking about from the Hebrew word for merciful, which is the word hased. We'll put that up on the screen and you can see it. Now, I want you to know it's difficult to translate the word hased into a single word because it's used in multiple ways throughout the Bible, but let me tell you what it means. It carries the idea of mercy or being merciful to the point of feeling someone's pain or feeling someone's need in a way that causes you to take some kind of action to relieve their pain or to meet their need. I'm going to say it again. It carries the idea of mercy or being merciful to the point of feeling someone's pain or feeling someone's need in a way that causes you to take action to relieve their pain or to meet their need. And that, friends, is really what Jesus is talking about here when he says, blessed are the merciful. But, and this is really important, so pay attention. He's not talking about mercy or being merciful that's found or that's motivated by human ability, by human feeling or by human emotion. He's talking about mercy. He's talking about being merciful that's motivated by the experience of God being merciful to you. God showing mercy or being merciful to you. To you. Think of it like this. On a purely human level, and when I say that, I'm describing just on the, on the ability that we all have in and of ourselves. On a purely human level, we can all demonstrate mercy to other people, but at the same time, I think we all have to acknowledge that it's going to be limited. Why? Why is it going to be limited? Because we're limited. Don't you find that's true? I mean, think of it like this. You know what? There are some days I can be the most merciful guy around, but you know what? Those are usually days when everything's going good in my life right? Other days when everything's not going good in my life, I'm not going to be nearly as merciful. We have the ability, all of us, based on our own ability to show mercy to other people, but it will always be limited because we're limited. But what Jesus is talking about here when he says, blessed are the merciful, is different because it's not a mercy that's based solely on our capacity for mercy, but on the unlimited mercy we receive from God, who is unlimited That's the reality of God's character and nature and being. He's unlimited, everything about him. Now, what would be a good example of that mercy that we receive from God? What would be a good example of the way God demonstrates his unlimited mercy to us? There's so many we could pick, but I'm going to choose just one to talk about. How about salvation? You have to, we would all have to say that God's mercy is on full display in our salvation, Look at these words on the screen from Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. Paul writes and says, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in, say it with me, mercy made us alive with Christ. You know what the words alive with Christ mean? That just means saved us. That's another way to describe salvation. Because of God's mercy, he's, because he's rich in mercy, he's made us alive with Christ. How about Titus chapter 3 and verse 5? This is the apostle Paul writing again. And in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, he says about God, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his what? Say it with me. Mercy. Again, because of his mercy. Now, I could put more verses up on the screen, but I'm going to stop right there. Do you know what this means? This means that the forgiveness of sin, which is essential, essential to salvation. I hope all of us understand that and would affirm that today. The forgiveness of sin is essential to salvation because it's sin that keeps us separated from God on our own. And so the forgiveness of sin, which is essential to salvation, is motivated, the Bible says, is motivated by the mercy of God. God's mercy caused him to feel compassion for our great need with regard to our sin. And so, as a result, God set in motion a plan that would provide for the forgiveness of our sin, and that plan was sending his one and only son, Jesus, into the world to die on the cross, to be punished in our place for our sin. When Jesus went to the cross, he paid a debt that he didn't owe because we owed a debt that we couldn't pay. And in God's mercy, he wanted us to have the opportunity to have that debt paid. Now, that's just one aspect of God's mercy to us. There are so many more that we don't even have time to talk about this morning. 
In fact, the Bible reiterates how, how much it says it's in itself about the depth of God's mercy. Look at these verses, Lamentations chapter two, uh, 3. Look at these words from verses 22 and 23. Uh, the writer says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, you notice I've got the word mercies in parentheses, in parentheses there, and you know why? Because what my NIV Bible in this setting translates as compassions is that same Hebrew word, hased, that's oftentimes translated mercies. I told you it's difficult to translate that word into a single word because it's used in so many ways. And so he's saying because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. God's mercies never fail. God's mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What a great description of the multitude of God's mercies. The multitude. Look at these words from Psalm 119 and verse 64. The psalmist says, the earth is filled with your love. The earth is filled with your love. You notice the word mercy is in parentheses there again. You know why? Because the word that my NIV Bible translates love in that verse is the Hebrew word hased. So it's the earth is filled with your mercies. This is the reality of God. And this, friends, listen to me. This is what Jesus is expecting from us when he says blessed are the merciful. Is it difficult? Is it difficult to show mercy to others in the same way that God has shown mercy to us? Everybody say absolutely. I mean, some days, so, some, some of you are convinced and others are not. I, I hate it when I ask you to repeat and only like three of you say something. <laughs> I just hate that. By the way, if you didn't know, I just hate that. It's, it's, like I said earlier, there, there are days when, when it's not as hard for us, but then there are days when it's difficult for us because, because being merciful to people in certain circumstances can oftentimes just be really difficult. Let's continue to talk about the difficulty of being merciful to others in the same way that God is merciful to us from the perspective of forgiveness, okay? Because God demonst- God's mercy is on full display in the forgiveness of our sin. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you're sinned, doesn't matter how much you've sinned, God's mercy is on full display in the forgiveness of your sin, which leads to salvation, the forgiveness of my sin, which leads to salvation. And so in turn, we should, we should demonstrate mercy to others who need to be forgiven by us. But that's not always easy. There's a great story Jesus tells in Matthew 18. We'll talk about it in detail when we get there in the study. But it's about a man who owed a king an incalculable debt. He owed him 10,000 talents. Now, we could just read that and and not capture uh, the the significance of that because that literally in Jesus' day was an incalculable debt. A talent was the highest level of denomination and currency in Jesus' day, and 10,000 was like an unthinkable number. It'd be like me saying up here and standing up here and saying that that somebody owed a king a bazillion dollars. I'm making up a word to try to emphasize how much money it is. That's what's really behind this idea of 10,000 talents. Well, the king comes and demands payment. You know the story. Uh, And the guy said, I can't pay it. There's no way he could ever pay it. And so the king says, well, I'm going to take your wife and your children. I'm going to sell them to try to recoup some of my loss. And the man falls down in front of the king and he begs for what? He begs for mercy. He begs for mercy. And incredibly, that's what the king does. The king forgives the debt. He forgives the debt. I mean, some of us are hanging on to the $10 somebody hadn't paid us back. And this guy forgives this incalculable debt. It's an, it's an incredible picture of mercy. Well, so that man who's been forgiven the debt goes out and finds another man, Jesus says, who owes him a hundred denarii. Now, in contrast to a talent, a denarii was nothing when it came to the currency of the day, and a hundred was nothing. This was a very manageable debt, but in the moment, the man couldn't repay the debt. And so, how does the, how does the first man pay forward the mercy he received from the king? Even though the man who can't repay the hundred denarii falls down and begs for mercy just like he did, he sends him to debtor's prison until the debt can be repaid. It's unthinkable. And when the king who forgave the incalculable debt found out what he did, how he responded, he rescinded his forgiveness of the debt, threw that man into prison, and the Bible says where he would be tortured until the debt would be repaid, that debt will never be repaid, which means that man will never be released from that. Never be released from it. Now, this just shows us how difficult it is to be merciful to other people 
in the same way that God has been merciful to us. Because clearly in this story, the king represents God who shows mercy to us by forgiving the incalculable debt of our sin. How did he do it? How did God do that? He, no, this is, he did it the only way that anybody can forgive sin or forgive an offense. He did it by being willing to absorb the pain and the cost of the mercy, to absorb the pain and the cost of the forgiveness into his own life and then move on. That's what God did when he watched his son beaten and brutalized and suspended on a cross between heaven and earth. He absorbed the pain and the cost of your sin and mine. So how can, you and I, how can you and I ever forgive somebody who has deeply offended us, who has deeply wounded us, who has deeply betrayed us, who has deeply hurt us? How can we do that? The only way we can do it is by following the example of God and finding a way to absorb the pain, absorb the hurt, absorb the betrayal, absorb the loss into our own lives. That means we release the opportunity to ever see somebody brought to justice for what they did. That means we release... Any level of revenge, that means that we release any need that we have to see somebody suffer on any level as a result of what they did. It's not always easy to be merciful. And that's just one dimension of mercy. One dimension of the way God demonstrates His mercy to us and one, de- one, one example of how we demonstrate mercy to other people. You know, I told you, but this is what you do. This is what you do. Remember, I told you that uh, blessed are the merciful is the corresponding beatitude to the first one, which is blessed are the poor in spirit. And so this is what you do when you recognize the reality of what God has done for you. When we talked about what it means to be poor in spirit, you remember I told you, I described what it means to be poor in spirit by taking you to Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14 in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Jesus tells a story one day about two men who go up to pray, up to the temple to pray. One's a Pharisee, a very religious man. One's a tax collector in that culture, a very sinful man. And so he describes the prayer of the Pharisee like this. The Pharisee stands up and he he makes sure everybody uh, sees him and hears him. And he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, like robbers or or, or adulterers or or even this tax collector, evildoers or even this tax collector. And then he said about himself, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of everything I get. So his prayer was all about him, right? All about how good he was. In contrast, Jesus said when the tax collector prayed, he stood at a distance. He wouldn't even allow himself to look up to heaven. He beat his chest and he said, God, have mercy on me. Uh, What? What did he say? Sinner. God, have mercy on me. A sinner. Now, I told you when we looked at that parable that that is an absolutely perfect description of what it means to be poor in spirit. But that's really not the whole story. Because the truth is, when we look at that tax collector who stood at a distance, wouldn't look up to heaven, beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner, what we see is not just a description of what it means to be poor in spirit. We see a description of what it means to live out all four of the first four Beatitudes. Because not only was he poor in spirit in that he recognized his spiritual poverty and his spiritual bankruptcy, but he was mourning over his sin. And not only was he mourning over his sin, but he was meek, he was humble, he stood at a distance, he wouldn't look up to heaven. But not only was he meek and humble, he was hungering and thirsting for righteousness as he said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And so at the end of the parable, Jesus said it was that man, the tax collector, who would go home justified before God. Now here's what that means. It was the tax collector who would go home that day having received mercy from God. And so it was that tax collector, because he had received mercy from God, who one day, because he had received mercy from God for the great need of his life, is the tax collector who would one day be able to be merciful to someone else because of the great need of their life. That's how this works. Blessed are the merciful. That's what Jesus is talking about. And this is what we need to, this is how we need to live. We need to be merciful to people. How are we merciful to people? Well, there are so many ways. We're merciful to people when we tell them the good news about Jesus. You know what? I would venture to say if you're a Christian this morning, the greatest act of mercy that anybody has ever shown to you is putting you in a position where you were able to be saved. Maybe maybe you were like me, and that just means growing up in a family that took me to church, so I was exposed to the truth of God, which ultimately led to my salvation. Maybe for you it was because somebody even at an older age in your life, 
asked you questions that led to spiritual conversations or invited you to church or shared their testimony, their story of salvation and faith with you and led to your salvation. There's not a greater way that we can be merciful to somebody than to give them the opportunity to be forgiven for their sin and live in a right relationship with God. We're merciful when we recognize somebody's pain or somebody's hurt or somebody's need and we, 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 we find tangible ways to encourage them and help them to come alongside of them. We're merciful when we forgive and you can go on and on and on. And this is what Jesus is talking about when he says, blessed are the merciful. Write down this question, what is the result of being merciful? Well, it's not, a, it's not a trick question because Jesus answered it. He says back in Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. But I want you to look up here because this is important. I want you to be really clear about what Jesus is saying here. When Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy, he's not saying just because you're merciful to people in this world, people in this world will in turn be merciful to you. Sometimes that happens when you do good things to people or for people. Sometimes they do good things for you, but not always. Nobody, nobody ever lived, nobody ever walked on the face of this earth that was more merciful than Jesus. How'd that work out for him? There came a time in his life when there was no mercy demonstrated to him. So when Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy, he's not talking about being shown mercy by our fellow man. He's talking about being shown mercy by God. When you're merciful, the way that Jesus describes in this beatitude, he says, here's the result. God's going to pour, listen to me, he's going to pour mercy into your life. I, for one, say, absolutely, I want that in my life. How about you? Look at this verse on the screen from Psalm, I think it's 86. And verse 3, read it with me. Let me hear your voices. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. That's me. Is that you? I call out to God for mercy all day long. I pray for his mercy in my life in so many ways, day after day after day. And here's the thing. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is what happens as a result of our deciding to be merciful. So let me ask you this question this morning. And Brian, Fred, you can come and we'll close. Have you received the mercy of God in your life? I want you to stop and think for just a minute. Not just a Sunday school answer. Have you, are you a recipient? Can you give a testimony today to being a recipient of the mercy of God in your life? Through salvation, through comfort, through provision, through encouragement ongoing forgiveness, if you can say yes, then the expectation of God, if you want to experience a happiness that's real, that's deep down inside, that's not subject to the circumstances of life, the expectation of God is that you'll be willing to be merciful to others in return. That's what Jesus is talking about.